So this flowchart shows us how design takes place when we have to take design for testability into consideration. So if you go back to module eight and look at how the design flow for a chip works, it has to be modified a little bit because of the presence of additional hardware for design for testability. So for example, you will have a behavioral description of the core chip, which is the uh, circuit on the test. And then you have a behavioral description for the additional hardware, the DFT. Now, these two, as we will see through the rest of this module, are usually intertwined, and it's really difficult to separate them from each other. So perhaps your VHDL file containing the behavioral description is going to be, um, is going to contain both of them in, um, in the same design file even. And then they have to go through synthesis so that you have a synthesized result. Once you go through synthesis, you have to go through a test design phase. In the test design phase, you will determine basically the test patterns that you need to apply to the finished chip. So then you determine what the inputs that you will apply will be. You'll also de decide what the gold standard against which you compare is. And this is usually obtained from one of the levels at which uh, the simulation is cycle accurate and bit accurate so that you can apply the test and compare on a bit by bit basis can compare the observations on a bit by bit basis. Uh, once you do that, you then do something called a coverage check. So a coverage check ensures that the test that you do covers the majority of the faults or the majority of the defects that can occur. Now, I should say the majority of faults because tests are usually uh, designed based on a certain level of abstraction. So we should be talking about faults rather than defects. Once you can ensure that your test is of good quality, and we will talk about what a good quality test is, it's basically a, a test that can uncover the, uh, the most, most of the uh, faults that can occur. Then you will go to implement, implementation and you implement your design, which includes uh, the uh, DFT. And then when you have the finished layout, you can ship it out and it will be fabricated. And then you also have your test. So then you have your finished chip and your test and you apply the test. And if the chip works, you can then ship it out. The ultimate aim is that the majority of our chips pass through our tests and also that our tests are practical, that they can be applied in a practical manner. So let's see what testing looks like in reality. So again, testing means that we are testing finished chips. Uh, so we're testing hardware. And so what happens here is that you have a uh, platform upon which you can mount the uh, finished chip. So this is the chip. And then uh, you have conditioning circuits. And so this is the chip mounted on a special mount, uh, which contains connectors uh, through which the pins of the chip automatically connect and disconnect so that the chip can be mounted and dismounted from this, uh, from this location. This is usually done using a robotic arm so that the robotic arm gets the chip and puts it here. Now, these, are, these conditioning circuits allow the chip to communicate with uh, the heart of testing. The heart of testing is the test computer. And so this is a specialized computer which uses a real-time operating system, uh, very bare bones so that it can be efficient. And what it does is that it generates a test pattern. Uh, this could be stored or it could be generated on the fly. We'll see different ways in which you can generate test patterns. These test patterns are then, um, are then applied to the uh, input of the circuit under test. And then the outputs are then fed to the memory of the uh, test computer where it stores them as the observations. Uh, then we can also uh, carry out the comparison with the gold standards so that we uh, can uh, produce test results, which pretty much say if the chip is functioning or not. So we compare the uh, observations with the gold standard and if they match, then the chip is good. If the chip is good, it goes to the good bin. And so there's a bin with where chips have passed the test. And if it fails the test, if we observe any errors that indicate that there's a fault, which indicates that there's a defect, then this goes to the bad bin. The um, chips that go to the good bin can be shipped out. The ones that go to the bad bin 
uh, are then going to have to be disposed of. Now, uh, the main aim is, the main aim of the uh, fabrication process is to have uh, chips that are mostly good. So you want the majority of your chips to work. And the percentage of chips that work is called the yield. So you want a high yield process, a process from which the majority of chips are functional. And you need to do this, you need to uh, check that the chips are working by applying the test. Now I have a, a really important question, which is how much time does this test take place? How much time does it consume? So how much time do we need to spend on a single test? This is important because it will inform everything we will do from, the, from now on. So the time it takes to test a chip will have two major components. One of them is uh, time expended to do mechanical tasks, mainly moving the chip uh, onto the testing platform and moving it off the testing platform. Let's assume that we have a relatively efficient process so that all of these mechanical tasks consume five seconds, for example. Uh, we can talk a lot, you know, we can discuss how long it actually takes for this to, to take place. Maybe some robotic arms are more efficient, but we will find out that this is not actually a very important figure. So five seconds, one second really doesn't matter because this is an overhead. It's just calculated once per chip, so it really doesn't matter. And five seconds is not a long time anyway. The other figure that's really important is the time it takes to apply the test. So let's assume that applying a single test pattern takes five microseconds. This is actually pretty efficient. Five microseconds is a good number because included in the five microseconds is generating the test pattern in the test computer, applying it to the circuit under test, uh, the circuit under test taking its time to produce an output, uh, all the conditioning circuits taking their time to condition the signals, uh, the com test computer comparing the observation to the gold standard and making a decision. So that's a lot of processing. And we're just going to assume that everything takes five microseconds. But that's to apply just a single input pattern. So let's, for example, calculate the time it takes to test a two input NAND gate. A two input NAND gate is a chip with two inputs and it's a purely combinational chip. So to fully test it, we have to test its uh, truth table. So we have to cover its entire truth table. The truth table has four rows, and therefore we have to apply four inputs. Each of this input is called a test. So we have to apply a test by uh, inputting an input 00, 01, 10, and 11. And then we make observations in the four cases, and we compare them to the gold standard, which is the truth table of an AND gate. Now, the duration of the test in this case is going to be about five seconds. Why is it five seconds? Because it's dominated by the mechanical time. Yeah, it takes um, 20 microseconds to apply the four tests once the chip is mounted. But, you know, that's a, a negligible time compared to the five seconds. Same applies for a four input NAND, which needs 16 tests to be fully tested and still will take more or less five seconds. On the other hand, when we start to move to more complicated circuits, like for example, an 8-bit adder. So an 8-bit adder is uh, it's going to have uh, 16 uh, inputs because it has two operands, each of which is 16 bits long. And so its truth table has uh, 64k rows, and that's the number of tests that we need to apply. Now each of these tests is going to take five microseconds, and so this leads to this number, which is five seconds. This is for the mechanical overhead plus five microseconds uh, multiplied by the number of tests here, which is two to the power of 64. So we start to see that now we have maybe a little bit higher, uh, a, delay, a, a time for test that's a little bit higher than five seconds, but it's still pretty good. You know, for a single chip to be tested in five seconds is still acceptable. Now, on the other hand, if we have a 16-bit multiplier, which is still a relatively simple chip. I mean, you don't actually fabricate chips that are just a 16-bit multiplier. That would be uh, just, it wouldn't make any economic sense, right? So that's still, that's still a, very, a very, very simple uh, uh, chip.
but a 16-bit multiplier has so many rows in its truth table because it has 32-bit inputs. It has two operands, remember. Uh, true that some of the uh, uh, input rows are kind of the same, but you still need to test them independently. And so that's going to take 11 hours, actually, to test. And you see, you start to notice that the delay, the time for test, is dominated not by the mechanical overhead, but by the actual time in which the test patterns are uh, applied and the comparison takes place. So the processing time of the test is the dominant factor in any circuit with any practical, uh, practical size. You know, 11 hours is, is, a, is a very large number, but it is still a number that we can have a discussion about. Maybe we can tolerate 11 hours. The problem is most circuits are not even combinational circuits. They are pipelines containing both combinational elements and sequential elements. In that case, calculating the uh, total number of tests becomes a little bit more challenging. Now, let's assume that I have a chip with M inputs. So these are M input pins. And so if I assume that this chip is completely combinational, then I need two to the power of M tests to fully test it. But now assume that this also contains N flip-flops storing N bits. So then this chip has two to the power of N states corresponding to the N registers. And so I need to apply all of the test vectors for all of the states. So this two to the power of M is just enough to cover the chip for one state. And I have two to the power of N states. So the number of tests is actually not two to the power of M as was used to do the calculations in this uh, table, but it's two to the power of M plus n. Now, this can be significant, it can be huge, and it can lead to a severe problem, uh, which basically means that we cannot do testing naively as we have been describing. So let's assume that we have a relatively simple processor or like a data path circuit, which has um, 40 inputs and 40 states. Just because of this multiplication, um, this, the exponent that we have here is going to be huge. And using the same figures of 5 seconds for mounting and 5 microseconds per chip, of course the 5 seconds for mounting are going to be completely insignificant because to fully test this microprocessor, we'll actually need 383 billion years. So to fully test it, which means applying all the possible inputs for all of the possible states, we need 383 billion years. This is completely ridiculous and nobody is going to observe this. And so a full test of this kind is not practical. So we have to define something really important called test uh, fault coverage. So fault coverage is a very important concept. An F or fault coverage is a ratio and it is the ratio between the number of faults that can be uncovered divided by the number of faults that could exist. So, I mean, it's a little bit hard to understand what this means, but let's assume that, again, you have this, the same chip with uh, 2 to the power of 80 uh, possible uh, combinations of inputs and states. And let's think about something a little bit more important than this huge number, which is how many faults can occur due, uh, inside this circuit. And let's assume that you have 3,000 possible faults that could occur there. And we will talk more about how to calculate the number, the maximum number of faults that can occur when we talk about the stock at fault model. But let's assume that 3,000 different faults can occur in this chip. Now, if you apply a small number of tests, you're obviously not going to uncover any, uh, you're not going to uncover all of these faults, but you're going to uncover some of them. So if you apply, for example, not the 2 to the power of 80, but 2 to the power of 10 tests, then you possibly could uncover 500 of the 3,000 uh, faults. That doesn't mean that 500 faults exist. It means that if one of the 500 faults exists, one of these tests is going to uncover it.
In that case, your fault coverage is 500 over 3000. And so obviously, fault coverage is a number that ranges between 0 and 1. Now, when we apply 2 to the power of n plus m tests, this means that we have applied all of the tests that we can apply. And this means that at this number of tests, f or fault coverage has to be 1. Because if there's any fault, one of these tests will uncover it. When we apply no tests, zero tests, then we have a fault coverage of zero. And what we see here is that fault coverage increases rapidly for a small number of tests. And then it starts to saturate really, really slowly and asymptotically almost appro approaches uh, a full, full uh, fault coverage of one. And so what this says is that the majority of faults can actually be uncovered uh, by applying a very small number of tests, whereas there's a marginal number of faults that can only be uh, uncovered by applying a very large number of tests. And so what happens practically is that perhaps we can tolerate these faults. Tolerating them means that we can tolerate shipping uh, chips which uh, have these faults. So we only apply this small number of tests to uncover this huge percentage of faults. And we, if the chip passes, we will chip, we will, we will chip it out. That chip has a possibility that it contains a fault, one of the faults that were not uncovered by the small number of tests. So what happens in that case? In that case, you have shipped a faulty chip and the customer, the consumer, is going to have a faulty product. And we all have experience with electronics. Sometimes you get a faulty product. And what happens in that case is that the uh, vendor will replace it. It just makes a lot more sense economically and practically to just ship out and tolerate this kind of uh, level of uncertainty about the uh, functionality of the, of the ship product and then just replace the products that fail. We'll talk mo more in the upcoming video about uh, how to quantify this by calculating something called defect level.